Hi, I'm Ari Redford, Head of Legal and Government Affairs at TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. Welcome to a breaking news edition of TRM Talks. Today, the US Department of Justice announced that it has arrested and charged two individuals with laundering funds associated with the 2016 Bifinex exchange hack. In addition to the arrest, after a years long investigation, agents recovered 94,000 Bitcoin with a value exceeding 3.6 billion. The Department of Justice explained this morning in its announcement that it was the largest seizure in the history of the department. Uh, it is probably uh, the largest, uh, or at least one of the largest seizures of anything anywhere um, in history. So uh, brought on a real panel of experts today to discuss the hack, the arrests, and really the unprecedented seizure um, seizure of cryptocurrency uh, in the case today. I'm joined by former United States Attorney for the District of Columbia, Jesse Liu, a partner at Skadden Arps, Matthew Price, Senior Director of Investigations at Binance, and Tigran Gambarian, Vice President of Global Intelligence also at Binance. Um, most importantly, um, both Matt and Tigran uh, were uh, cryptocurrency investigators, agents for years uh, with the uh, IRSCI, the Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigations Division, uh, who played a huge part in the in the case today, the arrests that were announced today, and really um, excited to kind of have their insights and really rely on you, Jesse, to help walk us through sort of what what this all looks like. Um, Matt, if you don't mind, let me let me start with you. Um, what what happened here? I mean, we read sort of a, a twenty plus page. Um, complaint, but if you can sort of walk us through what an investigation like this looks like and how we ended up uh, with the result we did. Sure. So, uh, you know, as, as IRS agents are trained and have been doing for 100 years, you know, they, they follow the money. So in this case, at a high level, you know, a large exchange was hacked, a significant amount of cryptocurrency was taken in that hack. And as the uh, charges today in the statement of facts lay out, the individuals charged had a a large part in moving and concealing the proceeds from that. Um, so essentially what, what you saw today was the result of, you know, months, years of intense financial investigations to lead to the identification of these individuals, enforcement actions that led to the actual identification of the location of the assets and then seizure of those assets. Terrific. Yeah, no, thank you. So Tigran, sort of building on that a little bit, I mean, you led investigations like this, you know, really your entire career, much of your career. How, how um, how, how does an investigation like this start? Um, and then sort of what, what, what happens from, from there? You know, and if you could sort of walk us through, there's a lot of information in this complaint about the use of blockchain analytics uh, that ultimately resulted in um, you know, helping to identify individuals. If you can sort of walk us through that. Right, uh, thanks, Ari. Thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, thank so, you. Uh, I mean, it, it, first you have to have an illicit act. So that's, that's, that's a start. So that's where either identifying kind of what, what the act is or what the criminal activity is and then trying to identify the target. I think, you know, historically it's been a little different when it comes to these acts, you already have a criminal act. You're just trying to find out who's behind it. A lot of these hacks and these uh, uh, kind of darknet sites who kind of operate out in the open but you just don't know who's behind it. And I guess that's been the goal of the CCU, both Matt and I um, have investigating a lot of these services and a lot of these criminal acts, Matt investigating Helix and Bitcoin Fog, who kind of is very familiar with the kind of what it takes to go after targets like this. Me, who was investigating numerous hacks, um, like I said, you have to have a criminal act and then that's kind of where the journey begins. And then you, in these crypto cases, it depends what you're trying to target. If you're trying to target a hack, which in my case have been involved in the Mount Gox hack uh, investigation, kind of see where the money's going to, right? Utilizing traditional financial investigative techniques, kind of in conjunction with blockchain analytics, and also kind of more in-depth analysis of the systems and how they're compromised and what took and how, if there are any traces behind that the actors may have played or left behind. So, but a large bulk of it is IRS agents. We focused on the financial tracing. And that's kind of what, we did previously in all these cases. We focused on the crypto side of things rather than on the more of the technical side of things, where historically that's where cyber investigators focused on kind of the traces that were left behind, IP addresses. We did a lot of that too, but most of it was focused on crypto and following where the, the stolen or dirty or the drug money went to. Um, 
and and then ultimately what you want to do is tie the stolen or the dirty crypto to an individual a real world identity and that's kind of where companies you know like finance and us working with investigators out there is important because you know it's kind of working together and trying to see if we can really identify who's behind this dirty money because eventually they have to cash it out at some point right and you you have to have you know at some point these guys want to have fiat they want to go get their lamborghinis and that that's where you know the exchanges come into play and i think in the complaint shows that i think uh the target used uh, numerous u.s based exchanges to launder some of the funds that he had stolen and, and so essentially basically uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, trace yeah. the money get to a point where you can identify where the bad guy is exactly so. that yeah that that makes perfect sense um matt one, one thing that seems like absolutely extraordinary to me about this case is look the investigation started or the hack occurred in 2016 and really what it shows is that law enforcement has been following the flow of funds across the blockchain and really time uh for for years and one thing that st stood out to me when you read the press release and this is all comes out of i think the complaint in much more detail um, but they talked about um, these individuals employing numerous sophisticated laundering techniques, including using fictitious identities to set up online account, um, utilizing computer programs uh, to automate transactions, um, depositing the stolen funds in different uh, exchanges, um, the use of dark net markets, Alpha Bay was specifically called out in the complaint um, to obfuscate transactions, um, breaking up the fund flow, converting Bitcoin to other um, virtual currency, and then also using anonymity to enhance virtual currencies, privacy coins, and also engaging in chain hopping and other obfuscation techniques. That's a lot. That's like the laundry list of obfuscation techniques. So it seems to me what's been happening is that for years, these individuals have been moving these funds through a series of mixers and, and other obfuscation techniques. Can you walk us through like, what does all that mean in, from, in terms of an investigation? Well, it means two things. One, so obviously, you know, one of the challenges with any cryptocurrency is it's pseudo anonymous. So you don't necessarily have an identification. But on the flip side of that, because everything is recorded on a publicly available blockchain, a ledger, essentially, there is the ability to follow those funds. So, you know, the criminals have kind of evolved to the point where they understand this and they understand that, you know, with the previous cases, as, as Tigger mentioned, Alpha Bay and, and similar cases, that eventually law enforcement is able to identify this. So, you know, in, in this case, these actors appear to kind of have tried to up the game a little bit and, and by using uh, techniques such as chain hopping um, or uh, mixing services, that's an attempt to defeat, you know, technologies such as blockchain analysis to make it more difficult to follow the flow of funds. But that said, that's not a foolproof technique. I mean, it certainly makes uh, the work a lot more difficult, but as, you know, today's announcement shows, it can still be done. Uh, and that's, you know, again, employing both sophisticated blockchain analysis techniques, but also kind of in the weeds investigative work, you know, the traditional financial investigative techniques that agents have used for years. Um, so again, I, I think what it shows is, is the lengths that these individuals went to try to kind of conceal the funds from the actual crime, but that at the end of the day, you know, the old school, old fashioned hard work, financial investigations still ultimately gonna identify the actors behind it. Yeah, no, really well said. Uh, Jesse, you were the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia that really presided over some of the largest crypto cases or cases involving crypto. Um, as an AUSA in that office for many years, one thing that stands out is, you know, look, you will oftentimes indict individuals um, that you will never likely get your hands on uh, in places like uh, North Korea, Iran, and elsewhere, uh, Russia. But here, it seems to me this case is extraordinary because there, there is actually going to be a court case. There are individuals who've been arrested and now are going to proceed through the court system. Would you walk us through sort of what that looks like starting today at an arrest? What a, what a potential court case could look like here? Well, um, court cases follow a, a fairly predictable pattern with, to use the language of the broad chain, some um, hard forks um, in the road um, at various points. But um, usually um, you can have a case either start with an indictment where there's already been a, a formal charge made or with an arrest that's based on a criminal complaint, which is what happened in this case. And uh, there's a requirement, of course, that people who are charged be brought before um, a judge um, without undue delay. And um, 
um, presented um, and made aware of the charges against them, and then the, the criminal process um, continues. So typically what would happen is at a point where um, defendants um, get to a point where they have to decide whether they plead guilty to an offense, which could be the offense that was originally charged or uh, something lesser, or actually go to trial. And um, within that process, um, and it happens a lot with um financial crime cases, um, there's an opportunity oftentimes for a defendant to cooperate with the government and um, share with the government information about other people who may have been involved in a crime. And um, that's it's very, very rare for um, very complex financial crimes to involve just one person or even two people. Typically, there are a number of parties who are involved, um, and the government is usually very interested in, in figuring out who else is involved. Um, um, so, um, you know, if there's a, a guilty plea, it can be a straight up guilty plea, as we call it, or um, a guilty plea with cooperation. If there's a trial, of course, uh, you know, we've all watched TV and movies, so um, we have a good sense of, of what that looks like. Um, but from a government's perspective, uh, oftentimes the most uh, valuable thing about bringing criminal charges is potential cooperation and getting more information about you know, what, what happened uh, and who else may have been involved. A couple of things that sort of jump out to me in, in terms of what you just said is that sort of uh, when you read the complaint, they weren't charged with the hack of Bitfinex. They were charged with conspiracy to commit money laundering from the from those proceeds. So I guess there's probably a question around whether, well, if they weren't actually the ones who hacked, is there someone that they could um, you know provide information on? The other piece that seems to me is that there's probably opportunity to cooperate around their methods of laundering these funds for four or five years. Um, there may be something that law enforcement or others can sort of gauge from the way they did that or sort of information around that. Um, if we could talk a little bit about the charges, I mentioned money laundering conspiracy. If you can talk a sort of a little bit about what that actually is and sort of what it means, um, you know, in, how the government was potentially thinking about bringing this charge. Yeah, I, I think the starting point is one that Tigran pointed out at the very beginning of our conversation, Ari, which is that money laundering starts with an illegal act, and and uh, it is essentially um, the crime of um, con of conducting further financial transactions to hide the origin or um, the destination of funds that were derived from some sort of illegal activity. Um, and so uh, I think the term money laundering is very apt because it really is uh, the act of cleaning, quote unquote, dirty money by, for example, um, in, in the old days, people would you know, take, say, stolen money or embezzled money and use it to buy a house or a car um, or invest it into, into a business. And it comes out the other end in a way that law enforcement has a much harder time trying to figure out where it came from in the, in the first place. And it works the same way um, on the blockchain when you take um, crypto from one source and put it through a number of different chains, um, chain hopping and, um, for example, like use a number of different exchanges, that sort of thing. It makes it much more difficult for law enforcement to trace the original source of those funds. Um, and so that's the concept um, behind money laundering. The important thing, I think, or one of the important things to remember about money laundering charges is that um, you can be charged with money laundering uh, without being charged with the, the underlying crime that gave rise to the illicit funds uh, or even you know, being involved in that particular crime. Um, so uh, and sometimes, of course, there are people who are charged with money laundering who are eventually charged with participation in the crime that led to the illicit funds. Like you can deal in drugs and launder the money and be charged with both and be guilty of both. Um, but you can also um, be charged with and be guilty of money laundering, uh, but not actually have any role in the drug dealing. You just take the money and, you know, for some fee, you put it through this kind of complex system of transactions that are designed to hide where it came from and where it's going. No, thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, the, the money laundering conspiracy charge uh, carries a 20 year, you know, potential 20 year sentence. Um, but at the same time, the court will look at the sentencing, the federal sentencing guidelines to determine that sentence. And the, the number, uh, the amount of money involved uh, plays a role in those sentencing guidelines. And my goodness, we've never had <laughs> a number like this. 
um, you know, involved in a sentencing guideline, which will really get those numbers very, very high. Jesse, there was, there's another charge in the complaint I wanted to ask you about, and that was um, 18 USC 371, which is conspiracy to defraud the United States. What is that? And what does that mean here? It is not um, a charge that tends to have movies made about it. You see movies about drug dealing and bank robberies and um, even money laundering. Uh, but uh, 18 U.S.C. Section 371 is, as far as I know, has not had a movie made about it uh, yet, maybe someday. Um, but the concept is um, that it's a charge aimed at um, defendants who try to defeat the lawful functions of some part of the U.S. government. And in this uh, case, what appears to have been charged is um, an effort to defeat the, uh, the, the functions of FinCEN, which is part of the Treasury Department, uh, by uh, you know, preventing appropriate uh, suspicious activity reports from being filed. But it's a very broad charge, um, although one that is actually much more common, I think, than most people recognize. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and I really appreciate you guys uh, joining me today for sort of just a quick rehash of this. Before I let you go, I would just love sort of one impression or, you know, a final thought on on these 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 arrests and the seizure today and really maybe where it's where it's headed or something you thought about when you saw this sort of pop at noon Eastern. Matt, can I maybe kick off with you? Uh, I mean, having been there and having had to deal with similar situations, um, you know, I you know there's a lot more to come. Uh, you know, this is kind of where the real work really starts uh, moving forward with uh, trial preparations and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it just shows the great work that, you know, the team effort that went into this case and that goes into all of these cases and, you know, the capabilities that law enforcement brings to bear. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, it looks like the team kind of pulled together and was able to, you know, crack, crack the big one. Tigran. Yeah, well, coming from the group and having worked with the case agent on this, I think he was just trying to one up our previous uh, largest seizure of no, all time. No so. one can one you up, Tigran. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, jokes aside, if you guys are listening, good, good work. Uh, keep fighting the fight. So, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, two sides of the same coin, I think, Ari, in terms of my uh, final thoughts. And one is that um, in crypto cases, generally, um, you see a lot of very traditional um, legal tools like subpoenas and search warrants being used to great effect, um, and a lot of good old fashioned investigative work, um, as well as um, charges under statutes that have been in existence for a long time and have been um, used to great effect repeatedly over the years to combat um, all sorts of criminal activity. Money laundering is one of them. Um, so in some sense, there's a, a, a traditionalism um, to the cases that we're seeing being brought in, in the crypto area. On the other hand, um, clearly, and you see this um, very sharply in uh, the public statements that were issued by DOJ officials um, in this case, as well as in, in other crypto cases, which is that um, the government is very focused on the potential threats that uh, cryptocurrency um, could pose to um, you know, the financial system and the way that cryptocurrency can be used to commit crimes. And so there's a recognition there that's quite forward looking and um, looking at kind of the, the risks and, that can be posed by this new technology and ways of countering it. So again, you have some traditional methods and statutes that I think seem to be working very well, um, as well as a recognition of uh, the ways in which a new technology can um, implicate some of those um, areas. Yeah, no, really well said. I mean, I would just, yeah, please. Just to add briefly to what Jesse said, you know, I actually think what what's kind of unique in this case and many of the cases that are kind of coming out now is it also shows not only was that technology, you know, new technology, blockchain and, and things like that involved in it, but it's also that's what helps solve the crime. Uh, you know, between the analytics tools, the relationship that law enforcement has built with private companies, you know, Clearly, a lot of exchanges collaborated in this, and you know, as we continue to do it at Binance and other exchanges, and that's the key is that kind of public-private partnership to to resolve these, right? You know, and I, I think that this is yet another example of of how that works well and how it can help kind of address any potential issues in the uh, the crypto ecosphere. Ecosphere. And yeah. and and I go back to kind of the uh, the but for right, but for crypto, a lot of these crimes wouldn't be solved. A lot of the cases that kind of came out of the group that we used to work in. 
uh, it's relied entirely on crypto. If crypto wasn't involved in these crimes, these crimes wouldn't be identified. And that's the thing. It's the transparency that, that uh, like Matt said, it's pseudonymous, but there is some transparency there. And it does allow for law enforcement and for private companies and exchanges to identify the criminal activity. And that's kind of what Matt and I do on a daily basis is trying to kind of, um, you know, work with law enforcement, work with industry, trying to identify victims of you know, potential thefts and work with, uh, with them to kind of recover the funds that we can then, you know, return to uh, potentially our customers or even customers of other exchanges. Well, this yeah. is a pure crypto case. Um, the crime, the underlying crime was the hack of an exchange that would not have existed without the blockchain, without cryptocurrency. Um, the methods that were used allegedly um, to hide the proceeds of that offense were blockchain-based efforts. Tigran, feel free to weigh in. Were you about to? Yeah, it's cryptocurrency that was used in this crime. You know, it's obviously a crypto case. It's a hack case. Um, but they did use cryptocurrency to kind of obfuscate kind of where the funds were going to, did a lot of transactions that lacked economic substance. But but at the end of the day, you know, once the money was spent, you know, the, the illicit act was identified. And this goes back to, you know, it does seem like a little bit like a rocket science. Like, what are these guys doing? They're just following numbers. And um, to a certain extent, you know, it, it is, but it isn't. So they're still relying on the traditional investigative techniques. Again, going back to kind of the days where we initially did this work was, which is in the Silk Road investigation where the blockchain analytics were used for the first time to identify criminal activity. And it's really evolved uh, and we've evolved with criminals. And as they've gotten better, as they've had better techniques like tumblers, for example, and some of the uh, reliance on kind of chain hopping. But again, the law enforcement and kind of the companies like TRM have evolved with it as well and have uh, really provided the tools necessary to identify these transactions, both for the law enforcement and for the industry. Yeah, so. no, I really appreciate your comments and um, and thank you guys so much for coming on. I think, it, it, you know, Matt and, and then Tigran and, and Jesse really nailed it with, look, I mean, it's an extraordinary moment and what it really is, is the, the sort of the, the coming together of years of great police work, public-private partnerships, and really all the things we're doing together to build a safer financial system. And um, to me, that's what's just such an extraordinary moment is to see, you know, folks who are really at the tip of the spear and you guys have been that for a really long time. So uh, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to uh, come on TRM Talks. Thank you.